You're listening to the Rent Roll Radio Show with Sterling Chapman. All right, listeners, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Today we have a a really special guest that I'm excited to interview. He is the founder and CEO of ASIM Capital, and he is the best-selling author of this book right here that I just finished and highly recommend to anybody who hasn't had a chance to check it out, Raising Capital for Real Estate. It's an Amazon number one bestseller. So Hunter Thompson, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks again for having me on. Much appreciated. So, Hunter, we usually just kick the program off and kind of, you know, asking the guests, why should we listen to you? Can you give us a little rundown of kind of what you what you've accomplished in the in the sector thus far? Yeah, you know, started for something that was very humble beginnings. I I spoke in a conference yesterday and someone asked me, you know, where do you get started? And I said in a room exactly like this one, you know, 10 years ago, I was going to networking events trying to figure out who I wanted to mimic my career after trying to figure out the people that I felt had risk adjusted, favorable investment strategies that were going to produce outside this returns. And in a time at which most people were very concerned about the real estate market, I was very excited about the potential opportunity. So I started doing that, you know, back then the podcast world had not really taken off yet. So this amazing resource that you and so many others, including myself, have offered in terms of free education just simply didn't exist. It wasn't as streamlined. You had to go to endless events. And so starting out trying to learn as much as possible from a few key individuals that had been able to weather that storm of 2008. And then now today, we've got hundreds of investors. I've raised upwards of $30 million and have a capacity to raise much more. It's just that we're very cautious about who we invest with and the types of deals we invest in and the types of underwriting that are associated with each of those deals. So those numbers are, are impressive and I'm very proud of those. But to a large degree, we're really patiently waiting and only allocating capital to properties that we are really confident in. So if you spend the time, if you spend a decade doing the things that we'll talk about in this show, you can be in a similar situation. It's just a matter of really being dedicated and hard work and also finding some key mentors that you can mimic their major moves. So what type of real estate are you, are you primarily investing in with your investors capital these days? Yeah. So if it's okay with you, I'll start with just kind of why I was interested in the world of syndications because that question, most of the time that you ask it, the answer is typically one particular niche. And my answer is that we have the ability to invest across multiple niches. And the reason we do that is that we invest in syndications across multiple operating partners that are focused on particular niches. So again, when I got into this business, I was quickly exposed to the world of pooling investors together and relying on a manager to operate the investment. So as an example, in the single family world, you typically have a $100,000 property. There's one investor. That property is managed by a property manager. We consider that to be active investing because if the property manager has a problem, they call you the owner of the property. Now, when you get into the world of syndications, you're pooling, let's say you're pooling 20 investors together, each of which are investing $100,000. This allows you to invest in high caliber, high quality, and complicated asset classes. So these are where you start to get into the world of real estate where the real estate is the underlying structure, but it's much more like a fully functioning business. So you've got multifamily, assisted living, self-storage, mobile home parks, office, retail, et cetera. And the more complicated the business, the more value a very experienced manager or what we call operator can bring to the table. And when they can bring a lot to the table, it can make sense financially for them to participate in a significant portion of the deal. And what I've kind of outlined there is the the entire structure of syndicated investments. When I figured out this structure, I was very drawn to it because my main goal was to be as diversified as possible. And this structure allows me to participate intelligently across multiple sectors, across multiple geographic locations without being overexposed or being a jack of all trades where I don't know a lot about self-storage, but I'm trying to try my hand in self-storage. I'd much rather defer to someone else's expertise who's been in the business for 20 years. Got it. So, and, and it was a leading question. I really asked because I, I know you had mentioned your relationship with Ryan Smith in the book. And I had a chance to meet Ryan and listen to his presentations while we were in Keystone last week. And he's actually going to be on the show next week. So I'm really excited about that. But I, I knew his focus areas 
were self-storage and mobile home parks. So I didn't know if you primarily focused on those areas or if you also did multifamily as well. Yeah. So we actually have a multifamily fund that is available right now. It's the first time we've done a multifamily fund in about five years. And the reason for this is that about six or seven years ago, I started to be extremely bullish on the mobile home park business in particular. I felt like the returns were just wildly asymmetric. It was very challenging to get returns that were comparable on a risk adjusted basis. And in that last seven years, the market has kind of gotten wind of that. So the returns have proportionally come down and now it starts to, everything starts to balance out. From my perspective, multifamily becomes very desirable again because it always is. It's just a matter of contemplating the ebbs and flows of the marketplace. That's nothing at all against self-storage or mobile home parks. I'm currently investing in both. It's just a matter of altering your strategy based on what's going on and what you have available to you. And just to clarify, Ryan is a really great partner with us. We've joint ventured with them and have invested very significantly with them and will continue to do so for years to come. That's kind of the entire business model, identifying best in class operators, getting favorable terms for our investors because we write very large checks and then passing that along to our investors so that they can experience the best of both worlds. They get to defer to our expertise, they get a favorable return, and then also the sponsor, Orion in this instance, or Elevation, they don't have to deal with the investor relations that come along with that capital. So we've got our investor base and we manage those investors. And that way a sponsor only has to write one check to our entity and we can write 100 or 200 checks to various investors across multiple investments. So you focus primarily or almost exclusively on the capital raising portion. You're not an active operator in any type of asset class. Is that correct? It depends. It depends on a lot of things. So we've done a lot of different deals with a lot of different structures, but it is not the case that a joint ventureship with us only includes that we're going to fund a particular amount of capital. That's true technically. It's also true legally. There's reasons for that that I can go into, but Anyone that knows anything about me or has listened to my podcast, you know that I really love to get into the details. So when we go into a joint ventureship, we basically play a significant role in our operating partner's business plan, whether that be from due diligence to marketing to legal documentation, all of it. We consult the operator to a large degree so that we feel comfortable with their structure in order for us to invest significantly. And just so I can kind of paint a picture. We're talking about $5 million, $10 million, $15 million. Because of the fact that we're writing a check of that magnitude, we have the ability to make alterations like that. Absolutely. So can we back up a little bit and kind of get into how you got started? One of my light bulbs from, from your book that I absolutely loved was the story of your first time you tried to raise capital when you had the big dinner party and nobody wrote a penny. And you, you just had this aha moment where you're like, instead of trying to convert people that want to invest in the stock market, there's plenty of people out there that want to invest mm-hmm. in these alternative asset classes. Why don't I go after them? So that I, I love that kind of shift in mindset. But can you just kind of back up to the beginning and tell your story? A lot of our listeners are are kind of, you know, on, on the newer end and, and like sure. you know, like you mentioned, just where do I get started? So, yeah. So I think that when most people talk about raising money, I think the way that they see it in their head is that there's they're the center of the graph, right? It's them in the middle. Like all of us think we're in the middle of the universe, but it's them in the middle and they want to go out and try to go to their family. They're going to go to their rich uncle that owns a franchise. They're going to go out to their aunt that they haven't talked to in five years and try to get them to listen to them about their deal and get them to send them twenty five or $50,000. And that makes sense, right? That's how we usually go about things. Like if you want new business, go out and get it. Well, in the world of raising capital in particular, but I believe this is applicable across multiple sectors of the economy. I don't want to go out and find anyone. I want them to come to me. And the reason for this is to your point, I failed miserably on my first capital raise. You know, I had the ability to get in front of a room of a group of people, friends and family and extended friends and family. So they're plus ones, they're plus twos, only accredited investors. Conservatively, $30 million was in that room. And 
I went through a presentation speaking as confidently and knowledgeably as I am today. I had a track record, had developed it for my own personal portfolio and for my immediate family's portfolio and was with an operator that was extremely well positioned and I fell on my face. And the key here is that I had the communication skills. I had the knowledge. I had the track record. I had the background. I had the strategic partnership. And I had the ability to communicate effectively and had a product that I was passionate about. Those are all the things that any sales teacher will tell you. If you have a good combination of all of that, you're going to get results. But that is only true in the world of selling products that are $30, $50, $1,000, maybe $1,500. In the world of give me $150,000, they have to be convinced of your entire worldview. And that is something that is not possible over a 30-minute presentation. They have to be indoctrinated to a certain extent about the same way that you view the world, especially when it comes to money. And it is not scalable to go out and try to convince one person at a time because you're talking about something that's basically a pseudo-religious experience. Forget everything you thought you knew about making money and listen to this presentation. But you can do that in a scalable manner. And that's what the book is all about. It's how to create an infrastructure to attract people that are already contemplating these types of investments, educate them through robust educational content, whether that be podcast interviews, article drafting, eBooks, lead magnets, converting lead magnets into, into buyers. This is like a funnel that you have to create. But once you do, the results speak for themselves. Once you do, I went from failing to raise a half a million dollars in my first capital raise to in a given week, I very well may receive an email in which I have raised a half a million dollars from people that I've never spoken to over the phone. Now, it doesn't mean that they don't understand the investment. It means that they have been able to understand the investment to a large degree without requiring any of my time. And that is how you go about creating a scalable real estate company. Awesome. So you talked about your track record going into that meeting. What was your track record leading up to that? Did you, yeah. did you go out and kind of start from scratch like so many of us out there who are buying ones and twosies? Or did you, did you just initially begin as a passive investor? We'll talk about the ramp up to, to get, yeah. get there. So two kind of interesting things. The first thing is, and I've talked about this only a couple of times before, but my summer job when I was in college was I was an online poker player. So my first investments that I made were proceeds from online poker and they were passive investments. When I started to see a, a track record there that basically that this worked, that it wasn't a fraud, you know, I spent a lot of time going on due diligence tours, looking at properties, going through underwriting models, I'd established that it was working and started to receive the proceeds of that. Then I started, you know, my, my immediate families, like my mom and my sisters started investing alongside me. And that was the beginning of my track record. And then from there, I created my first fund, which the intention was to invest directly in another investment right? So a operating partner had created their entity in which they were buying mobile homes. And I created a, what's called a fund of funds. And I basically said, look, I have created, I have found an amazing investment opportunity, conducted a significant amount of due diligence on this. I'll create a fund. And once you guys get your money back, I'll take 15% of the proceeds or something like that. So that's a pretty standard fund of funds model. And I ended up, by the way, being able to raise a half million dollars, but it wasn't because I was able to uh, create this infrastructure. It was just scrambling for capital. Anyone that's in the business of um, raising money knows you've probably been there before where it's like the last minute, you got to call some random friend you never talked to in a long time and say like, hey, I need to borrow a hundred grand for like three weeks. <laughs> that's what I, I wrote the book because I didn't want to be in that position again. And people don't have to if they focus their efforts on the right things. Awesome. So what type of investments were those first ones you started investing in? So like I said, I was very fortunate both in terms of market timing, in terms of when I graduated college, right around 2009, when things were, had already happened. But that market timing was also fortunate because I moved to California where it was very, very pronounced. You know, the real estate collapse was very significant. There was, I think, five states in which Half of all the foreclosures in the United States only took place in five states, and California was one of those. Florida was another one. It's not surprising to anyone. I'm mentioning that because that market acted like a massive filter for bad ideas. 
And so when I started going to networking events, I was quickly surrounded by some of the most sophisticated and savvy and influential investors in the state of California. And so I was able to leapfrog a lot of the nonsense that sometimes people get burned on, you know, investing in properties that, hey, you can buy three houses for (laughs) $22,000 and that stuff. So I was able to mimic their investment strategies, which led me to things like mobile home parks, cell storage, debt, all those types of things that sometimes investors take years to understand. Can you walk us through the kind of the numbers on one of these mobile home park investments, both from from the perspective of of you investing in it, how the mobile home park performs, and then from what, what your investors see, what type of returns they typically see, and what the whole periods of that looks like? Yeah, sure. So from a big picture perspective, I'm sure that a lot of your listeners are familiar with why the mobile home park business is compelling, but I'll just give a high level overview. When I found out that number one, there's a tremendous amount of demand for this product. There's 10,000 baby boomers hitting the age of retirement every single day. Many of them are relying on social security as a main source of income. The average social security check is typically around $1,400 a month. The average two-bedroom apartment rents for about $1,300 a month. So the ability to have your retirement paid for by Social Security is basically not a reality economically, mathematically. It's not possible to do that. So you have all this demand taking place, an ever-increasing amount of demand. And on the other side of that coin, you have a literally contracting supply. Every single year, less and less mobile home parks exist because the development of mobile home parks is basically banned by municipalities all across the city, all across the country. And they're always looking for reasons to destroy them. Now, just a quick history lesson, in the 60s and 70s, the mobile home parks were considered upscale communities. That was like the advent of the suburbs back then. But since then, things have changed. And now mobile home parks are considered eyesores. So there's literally less and less of them and the demand grows every single day. And so that's a massive tailwind. And I found that very, very compelling. Something else about that is, as your listeners probably assume, there's a lot of mismanagement in that business. It's a headache. It's a nightmare. And and so you've got owners that own only one property and they do things like not raise rents appropriately or on the other side of that, they can also drastically overpay for certain things, such as property manager. You know, we've bought properties where the property manager was making $75,000 a year. That's a job that should be paid around $25,000 a year. It's a part-time job. So if you have a property that is paying a property manager $75,000 and it should be paying $25,000, you're talking about $50,000 of NOI. And if you divide that by, let's say, an eight cap, you're talking about $625,000 of value they can produce by simply hiring a new property manager or replacing them or basically reducing their income. So that's very compelling. But the numbers start to get even more compelling when you talk about the number of lots and how significant some of these properties are underpaying in terms of the actual rental rates. So we like to buy properties that are 100 lots or so. So you have a property that's very commonly, let's say, you know, it rents for $400 a month, but it should be renting for $500 a month. That sounds wildly outlandish if you're talking about a percentage basis, but because the mobile home park business is based on gross dollars, because the tenant base is concerned about, can they make their next payment much more so than any other asset class? You can see mobile homes be 20% under market rent. And because the asset class is on monthly leases, you can see a situation where you would want to raise rents by $25 or so four times in a given year. So just to put some numbers on that, let's say you have a hundred lot property, that's a hundred dollars under market rent. So it's a hundred times a hundred, that's monthly. Then times that number by 12, you're talking about $120,000 of NOI you can generate by just implementing those rental increases. Now, if you divide that $120,000 by an eight cap, you're talking about $1.5 million of value. And there's a lot of reasons I can go into why it's straightforward to accomplish that goal. The tenant base doesn't move. They don't own the actual, they own the home itself. So we don't own the home, we own the lot. And the homes are very expensive to move. 
So you're talking about generating $1.5 million of value creation with very little risk. And I found that very, very compelling from the get-go. So would you say that the the rise in self-storage facility is kind of a companion to the same factors that have led into mobile home parks expansion? Basically, those same baby boomers who who spent their whole lives in a big 2,500 square foot house now moving into, and of course, nobody wants to get rid of anything. So they, they, they're putting it in a self storage facility. Can you go right. over, can just like you did with the mobile home parks just now, can you give us a little rundown for self storage? Yeah, sure. So I also really like the self storage business because the mobile home park business is very compelling to me because it's recession resistant. And I think the self storage business and the data is very compelling. If you go to our website, you can download an ebook that discusses this matter. But the data is very compelling that the self storage business is very recession resistant as well. And the reason for this is that people use the product most significantly when they're going through some sort of economic change, in the sense that the demand for the product is caused when people come home from college unexpectedly, when people change jobs or have to move or get laid off or have to downsize, all of those things are more common during recessions or economic contractions. So anytime that you have an investment vehicle that the demand to a certain extent is inversely correlated with the overall economy, the investment's going to be quite balanced during the whole economic cycle. Because when times are good, you can always raise rents. You can always get favorable financing. Those things are all, like all real estate moves up when the economy does quite well. The valuations people are going to pay are much higher. But when the economy does poorly, if you can find asset classes that are well positioned to take advantage of that, you kind of get the best of both worlds. And self storage is a great example of that. You know, one thing that I like about self storage is that it's also on monthly leases. And it's a very nickel and dime business. So you can find a property that should be renting for $115 a month. That's renting for $100 a month. And if you wanted to, you can raise rents by 15% in one month. Now, some of you may balk at that and say, okay, I want to do it. I want to do it in increments, which is totally fine. But the key here that is so compelling from a tenant base standpoint, we're talking about dollars, not percentages. It's not 15%. It's $15 in that instance. So the question is, how many of the tenants are going to take the day off work, hire movers, get a rental truck, pick up their stuff and move right down the street where they're probably going to do the same thing for $15 a month? And the answer is not very frequently. So you can see how that can continue on. Okay, now we've raised it up to $115. Well, let's say it's another 5%. And then if the market demands it, another 3%. And those percentages are amazing as investors, but the gross dollars are not as impactful from a a tenant's perspective. So what is your economic forecast for the next few years? And how do you think that'll impact the the asset classes? And what will ASIM Capital be investing in primarily because of the result of that? You know, I tend to have a view that is specific to real estate. And the reason for that is obviously that's how I spend most of my time. But most importantly, my entire portfolio is basically invested in syndications. So that's where I need to spend my time focusing. So in terms of the overall economy, I feel a bit detached from that. Now, I do talk to economists on my podcast, the Cashflow Connections Real Estate Podcast. I've talked to IMF consultants. I've talked to authors and industry leaders. And so I have a good understanding as far as what's going on, but I'll give you a perfect example. I'm not really privy to, you know, the current price per earnings ratio in the stock market. And it doesn't impact my life because I don't have investments in that asset class. But what I can tell you for sure is that there is about to be a tremendous demand for senior living. All of these data points that we've been talking about lead this to continue. Now, the baby boomers, they're, quote, hitting the age of retirement. That age is 65. That's when we say the age of retirement. That's what that refers to. Most people, when you move into a senior care facility, they're not 65. Typically, they're like 78, 82, somewhere in that range. So you see this massive baby boomer population taking place. You can see the demographic shifts taking place, and all of that interest is about to go into the senior living spot. That, of course, is something that savvy investors are hip to. It's probably something that a lot of your listeners are like, oh, yeah, I knew that three years ago. 
So here's what's up with that. That industry is very complicated, but those complexities lend itself again to there being a huge discrepancy between a mom and pop owner and a best in class owner. And we have identified several of what we believe to be best in class owners and are starting to invest in that industry um, for a lot of reasons, one of which is that overwhelming tailwind which is being created. Talking about raising money for real estate, I failed that first capital raise of half a million dollars. We just put out a deal in the senior living space where the goal was to raise two million. We raised four million in 48 hours and, and had to send nice. out an email saying, please stop, we're oversubscribed. And even if you're on the wait list, it's unlikely that you're going to be accepted. And if you put in the work and you understand what you're doing, and you mix an amazing combination of industry knowledge with internet marketing, you can accomplish those things as well. But you have to be an absolute expert. I mean, you can tell, by the way, that I've glossed over some summaries of these different asset classes, but I assume that you can tell that I could hold a one-hour conversation on each of these. Sure. And that's even considering that we still defer to an expert's expertise. So there's levels to each of this game. And so it's important to find your position, dedicate to being an absolute expert, and understand that it's not going to be easy and that even people that seem like they have made it had some major gut punches during their career that your memory has kind of smoothed over. <laughs> so for our listeners that are currently maybe part of the group that you talked about in that first meeting where they're comfortable in the market, but they're on the fence, they're, they're listening to the podcast because they're, they're starting to get some curiosity about these mm. alternative asset classes. What type of returns do you typically provide for your investors? And what, you know, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. You know, we target somewhere in the range of the low to mid teens. And that speaks to the risk that we're willing to incur. So we invest in light value add to stabilized deals, meaning that if there's a property that is in a market that's 96% occupied and our particular asset is 65% occupied, that's about the most risk we're willing to incur. Obviously, the business model there would bring, bring up that occupancy up to market rates. And we usually look for assets that are going to be cash flow positive within the first two quarters. And that's the, the most risk that we'll incur. And I think that you can achieve those low to mid teen returns in today's climate. Now, in all fairness, we were quoting low to mid teens when we started investing in 2011. And some of those deals were absolute home runs. But from my perspective as an entrepreneur, my goal is to put myself in a position to deliver for our clients. And I want the returns to be lucrative enough so that I'm able to accomplish the goal of getting investors' attention. But we still want to be able to, at the end of the day, say we put ourselves in a position to underpromise and overdeliver because our relationships with our investors is absolutely critical. You read the book, you know how few investors it takes to really create a very scalable, very lucrative <coughs> real estate firm. And so each of our investors is absolutely important to us. Absolutely. So what advice do you have for somebody who's looking to get started and starting to get interested in the space? Focus on education. Websites like this, the one that you're listening to and, and the podcasts and just the entire industry of free education is readily at your fingertips. And it's something that you can at least spend six months on before investing in a, any sort of program. Now, I previously didn't know how I felt about the paid program world. But I, we did launch a program two years ago and it completely changed my perspective on that space. You know, I grew up in a world where anyone that sold a course didn't know what they were talking about, to be honest, right? Because I grew up post recession where everyone, all of a sudden there was all these $50,000 boot camps on how to flip houses and everyone got their shirt wiped out. And then you learn around, you, you figure out that the guys that were teaching those courses didn't really know how to flip houses. So that's what I was really influenced by. But I have seen, once you do get to the point where you're starting to feel like you're hitting a ceiling and you understand the concepts that are being talked about on podcasts, the world of paid mentorship, I'm now a huge believer in. Because in the world of education, there's tell you what to do, do it with you and do it for you. And those increase in terms of the, the amount of expense that you're going to need to pay to have that service. The book 
It's available for free on raisingcapitalforrealestate.com. That is a tell you what to do. And I'm sure you've read it, you know, I don't hold anything back. I say, this is exactly what to do. Here are the apps, here's the script, here's the email templates. I just say exactly that. But then the do it with you is like a mentorship program. And then do it for you, which we don't do. That's when you start to get into those super high numbers, but you get those one-on-one types of, of consulting, which we don't do because I don't have the time to. Yeah, I think that the do it with you, the whole taking action piece is, is so critical. I forget where, I think it was a Bigger Pockets uh, episode I listened to one time, Brandon Turner was saying, if information was the key, we'd all be billionaires with six pack abs. Like the, the information is readily available there, but having somebody there to, to push you along to take action is, is, you know, what really takes it to the next level. Totally agree. And also that financial commitment. This is the thing that I learned we launched this mentorship program, which is cfcmentorshipprogram.com. And I opened it up, people went through it. And six months later, I realized that their career had really just taken off. And I was like, wow, what is it about this? And a lot of it has to do with the fact that if you pay that money, you're doing everything you can to get it back. And that little insight has, man, there's so many savages out there, like monsters that have gone through our program and many others that you see, you see them at a conference one year and then you see them at the same conference the next year and they're in a completely different space. And I just love helping people do that. I definitely, I'm, I'm coming around to the concept for sure. I like, like you, I've always kind of had a negative connotation about it. But when you meet people like, like Whitney Sewell and, and Ellie Perlman and Dan Hanford who like paid for Joe's program and then fast forward two years and they've got hundreds, thousands of, of units you kind of you just see those success examples over you start to wonder like there's got to be something to this yeah totally totally and there's i don't know if you've heard of a lot of these guys but ellis hammond adam carswell these are people that you're going to know their names very soon and i'm so proud of those guys i'm so proud of the what we've created with all that and and joe is a monster you know joe is the kind of guy where you're like dude like how many hours do you have in a day? <laughs> yeah but it's not about him just hustling harder than everyone. It's about him creating systems and processes that are just extremely efficient. And he's a massive inspiration because of that. Awesome. So next up, it's just our kind of our final three. What's your favorite book? Let me give you a business book. Oh man, the most influential book I think in my life is Miracle Mornings for Entrepreneurs. So you've probably heard of Miracle Mornings. But the specific... I just, I just bought a, a journal to start journaling. Yes. Love hearing that. So for the listeners, Miracle Mornings is Hal Elrod. He co-wrote Miracle Mornings for Entrepreneurs with Cameron Harold, who's like one of my, like, he's the man. Like, just aspiration, totally goals. Like, he's so cool. And I really like Miracle Mornings for Entrepreneurs because Hal Elrod kind of goes into the world of, number one, waking up early which I now love and didn't used to love. I'm talking about years ago. I read this book and it's been like this ever since. Meditation, working out, which I'm a huge proponent of, and journaling, scribing, contemplating your future, envisioning your goals, et cetera. That stuff can feel hootie tootie for certain people that are like, you know, CPAs, attorneys, guys like us that love numbers. And we're like, where's the ROI on this 10 minute meditation segment? But that's a good segue to the risk adjusted return of meditation. Like what's the worst case scenario if you take a minute to listen to Headspace? The potential upside is unbelievable. Trust me. I am one of those analytical guys. Then Cameron Harold, who is the COO of Got Junk, he co-wrote the book. And so the second part is very operational. And so it's a good part of both of the parts of what makes a successful entrepreneur. I know that was a long answer, but go read it if you haven't already. Absolutely. And, and, you know, my observation on you, you mentioned how a lot of people view this self-development stuff as hokey, but over and over and over again, if I talk to every successful person I know, they all swear by it and recommend it. And if I talk to every unsuccessful person I know, they can all tell me how stupid it is. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> That's so funny because I haven't used that example with the other part because you're so right. right? It, so it's like, you start to see people repeating the same thing and you can start, you can put it out for a while, right? You can be like, oh, Tim Ferriss is just a weirdo. Oh man, you know, Tony Robbins is just out there. And then eventually you're like, oh man, Oprah Winfrey, okay, like whatever. And then you're starting to be like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to give it a shot. I'll sit in silence for 10 minutes every morning. What's the worst that can happen? Right. So, yeah. 
Awesome. What's your favorite quote? Oh man, I'm kind of, (laughs) um, so Charlie Munger inspired a quote from me. (laughs) That's why I started laughing because it's my own quote, but basically that even ethical people can have their vision clouded by improperly aligned incentives. And that's something that I live by. So it was inspired by Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. And it's basically, I want to ensure that my business from top to bottom is so hyper aligned with our investor base that I never have to wake up in the morning and see and say, on whose behalf do I want to act in today? So everything we do is with that in mind. You know, I'm usually the largest investor in each of our offerings. The fees are appropriate given what's at stake and they're heavily weighted towards performance. So that way we don't do deals unless we think they can perform above a preferred return. And that feeling is just a weight off anyone's shoulder because now I don't have to worry about whether or not I'm trying to push something through because it may give me an upfront fee. I know if I have more money invested than any of our investors or usually up there, then I don't have to worry about that scare thing happening because I'm going to act in my own best interest. It's not to defer. The point should not be to try to find like the best ethical actor in the world. It should be create a system where you don't have to. And that's what we've focused so much. And that's kind of a Milton Friedman quote as well. Awesome. I love it. I love it. What's your favorite thing to do when you're not working? I like to work out a lot. I'm actually running a marathon in three days. It's my first ever marathon. I kind of have a background as a high school runner, but I'm super excited to run from the Dodgers Stadium in downtown LA to Santa Monica. And then once that's done, I will divert that energy to something else. So like a CrossFit type of stuff generally. Yeah. I've done four fulls. Oh, have you? Oh yeah. Four full. I've done four fulls and then I've done 270.3 Ironman. So my... I had a goal to do a full 146 Ironman and it was right yeah. at the, around the time I got interested in real estate and was about to have a baby. And I just, I kind of had to pick a lane. So I thought, let me build up my real estate deal for a few years yeah. and then I'll, and then I'll circle back to the full Ironman. That is awesome. Let's do a show just to talk about the world of endurance in particular and the impact on the brain and the psyche and motivation stuff, because I'm sure I have a lot to learn from you because you went to a place that almost no one has ever gone in preparation for those things and in execution of those things. So that's awesome, dude. Awesome. So where can our listeners find you? you? Can I just, can I say something real quick about that? I know I I keep answering these long winded things, but I just (laughs) like creating a lot of value. A lot of people listening to this, there's a couple of different people out there that can get something from what we just discussed. Some people who are quasi elite endurance athletes or people that work out regularly and have a thing and they're like, yes, my boys got it for sure. Check that off the list. Like, I don't need to hear anything about that. Then there are people that are like, they used to do something like that. And they're like, okay, yeah, I totally used to do it and I get it. So I'm like on the same team and I can check that off the list or people that don't have something like that in their life. And they're like, oh, that's not for me. I'm checking it off the list. None of those are acceptable. (laughs) (laughs) Like here's what's acceptable. There are levels to this game but the levels are not consequential. So in the world of endurance sports, time is the factor, right? So there's me, I'm trying to run a marathon in 312, okay? That's cool, that's aggressive, I'm super excited about that. If I accomplish that, I'm gonna be really happy. My coach made the Olympic trials for a female, which is 245, which by the way, is running a marathon in 615s for the entire duration. When she goes to compete at the Olympic trial marathon, only three people get to go to the Olympic team. And that's like, you're in like the 540 per mile range, which is in the world of endurance, wildly different from the range she's in. Mm. Now, the truth though, is that all of this doesn't matter as long as you have an answer to this question. What have you done today? If you can answer that question, which by the way, sears your soul if you don't have an answer, If you can answer that question, now we're all on the same team. Now, it doesn't matter if you're on the way to the Olympics. It doesn't matter if you're running your first 5K or you're trying to lose 30 pounds or whatever. But dude, it feels good to have an answer to that question. So let's make it happen. Absolutely. So where can our listeners find out more about you? Where can they find you? Tell us us all your your websites and, and contact info. Sure. So first of all, I appreciate you having me on. And congratulations with the show. I know you're going to kill it. I really enjoyed the conversation. So raisingcapitalforrealestate.com is the book. 
It's really, I'm super proud of it. If you listen to our podcast, which is the Cashflow Connections Real Estate Podcast, you know I kind of pride myself on getting into the details and going to an extra level of sophistication. That is the way that the book was written. I wanted to provide everything you need to, to accomplish this massive, massive vehicle for personal and freedom growth, financial growth. Our investment website is asymcapital.com. If you're an credit investor, love to help you out. You know, we've got hundreds of investors and we'd love to include you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hunter. We'll definitely continue to, to keep in touch and can't wait to get you back on to hear more about your story later. Thanks again. Thanks for tuning in to the Rent Roll Radio Show brought to you by Crestworth Capital. We hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, please hit the subscribe button and leave us a rating and review. You can also visit us at CrestworthCapital.com or RentRollRadio.com or follow us on Facebook at RentRollRadio or at Crestworth Capital. If you would like to reach us, feel free to shoot us an email at info at rentrollradio.com or sterling at crestwordcapital.com. We hope you come back next week to join us on some more of our journey. Until then, happy investing.